good soup. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to review episode 5 of House of the Dragon, We Light the Way. Good episode. Some would say a great episode. I honestly think it's the best episode of the season so far. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The last 10 minutes or so had me just, my brain was like white static. I had no idea what was going on. And the build up to this moment was also incredible. The small character moments, the visual storytelling continues to be mint. Everything about this episode was House of the Dragon firing on all cylinders. So I liked it. The tension they were able to build during that wedding was incredible. Like we all we all know Game of Thrones weddings don't usually typically don't end well. Usually they seem like everything's going great and it kind of catches you off guard. This one, there was just an uneasiness throughout the whole thing that you're like something is about to pop off. But yeah, I agree with you. It's I think it's the best episode of the season. Wow, Aaron, this is why we pay you the big money. You know, we missed you last week, but you're back better than ever. But before we get any more of your thoughts, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is a great option for those looking to stay safe on the internet without breaking their wallets. Right now, they are running a huge discount on a three-year subscription for the low price of just $1.99 per month, and that also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. But once you sign up for Atlas VPN, you'll never want to browse the internet without it. With Atlas, you will enjoy blazing speeds while streaming your favorite content or sports shows without any interruptions, buffering, pop-ups, or ads. You could stream your favorite shows privately without worrying about tracking and censorship, which is extremely important in today's world. Atlas VPN will also give you the option to stream content from around the world. Can't access your favorite shows while traveling abroad? No problem. Atlas VPN has got you covered with a simple click of the button. Plus, their apps on Android and iOS are very user-friendly, giving you the option to connect to dozens of servers around the globe. Not only will you be treated to a buffet of international servers, but you can protect all of your devices with a single subscription. You heard that correctly. Unlimited protection regardless of the device for just $1.99 per month. This offer won't last long, so if you're interested in joining, click the link in our description box below to start enjoying the peace of mind that comes with internet protection and security. With Atlas VPN. Hey, uh, thank you for not interrupting me this time with the ad. Oh, uh, no problem. I appreciate that. We've actually got another ad coming on. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay. Let's get into the episode. So the episode begins in Runestone, and we're introduced to Damon's wife, Rhea Royce. Very short introduction. Claire Kilner coming back for this episode after doing a wonderful job epi uh, directing episode four. I thought that this was shot very well. Like I said, a nice introduction not only to Rhea Vo uh, Royce, but a reintroduction to the Vale, that atmosphere, the mountains, the elements, the difference between the Royces and the Targaryens. They're out with the wilderness. They're actually doing things on their own, and... You know, the Targaryens are just playing the game, right? Damon, <laughs> how long has he been gone at this point, right? He was never there, then he went off to fight a three-year war, and he shows up all ominous and cloaked. Just not a great um, reunion between the two of them. Never had sex. She, never she got that last it. dig on him, right? We mentioned this in the preview, the, those ambiguous threads from Fire and Blood. We're getting confirmation now. You could kind of pick up that it was Damon in yeah. the book, even when you're reading it, but... Now we actually see it. So it's this sort of objective perspective on these events, even though some things have been changed, and we'll talk about that a little later. Totally dressed like he's not going to commit murder. No. <laughs> yeah, right. I think it just kind of furthers established Damon as this great character that you never know what he's going to do or what he's capable of. This might be like the most straight up evil shit he's done so <laughs> far. At least when he was murdering people in King's Landing, they were charged with crimes, <laughs> you know, murder and rapists and uh you know, people who deserve it, but like she was just going out for her daily stroll and instead of getting a divorce, he's like, I'll murder you. I guess they didn't have divorce back then. But um Rhaegar got his shit annulled. Yeah. So I think there was different ways to go about Radar it. Rhaegar seems a bit more level headed than this guy. Yeah, he probably thought of over mulled over it for five minutes and was like, I guess I gotta murder yeah, her. You know what? Oh, hands are tied. <laughs> Fuck. I just love my niece. Blood is thicker than water, you know? Yeah. 50 Cent said that once, right? I believe he came up with that, yeah. <laughs> I felt bad for her. I guess, too, that's yeah. a, I guess that shows that it was an effective scene. She leaves a, an impression. She feels like a lady from the Vale, a, a legendary hunter. Everyone kind of knows that about her. So, yeah. I wonder what his problem is. <laughs> like, in terms of, like, Masaria, 
Rhaenyra and what Rhea said, like three beautiful women not, not being able to necessarily perform. Like, I guess there's just something so deeply rooted inside him that just maybe it's similar to Roman Roy. I don't know because if it's, he's yeah, maybe that or he's just so disconnected i feel or like he can't make me maybe form some sort of attachment i don't know i'm not um was it the psychiatrist psychologist will deal with that stuff sure okay yeah uh maybe he just needs to you know what are those roman <laughs> roman uh maybe he needs a was it viagra he can oh, use yeah, something sure. like that i don't know but well you can't well <laughs> you can't trust these macers when they're treating targaryens <laughs> that's something i wanted to bring up <laughs> Because people have been pointing that out, and we haven't talked Your about that. Your erection lasts for more than eight hours. See and mace it immediately. They're gonna give them. They'll a put a leech on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just the not the right thing to do. But uh, people have been pointing that out on uh, online. The Grand Macer conspiracy. It's something that we talked about when Game of Thrones is out. That the Macers contributed to the downfall of the Targaryens. You had that one spat between the Grand Maester and one of his subordinates, mm -hmm. saying we should do this, and the Grand Maester's like, no, the. King loves the leeches. He always feels relief. <laughs> He's sitting there looking like SpongeBob with the suds. <laughs> he has fucking eyes Look coming at out leeches. of the socket. The leeches been working great for him. Are Look you at saying him. that this man's on the best shape of his fucking life? But that's interesting, right? If if nothing, it kills him. Mm -hmm. So it removes a, another Targaryen from power. But it also makes him ineffective as a leader. So he's kind of unable to, I mean, we've seen it all season. He's unable to pull his house together to basically get them in order to make sure that there is a smooth transition, that the Targaryen dynasty is solidified and strong. But him being such a weak king, not only emotionally, mentally, but now physically, it really weakens his ability to do that, to keep everything intact. Right. So that's an interesting idea that people have been throwing out around. And there. you can even go, go back to Emma's birth and the complications with that. So there are many times where they've right, been around. No that, one's in the room. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden there's the great complications. That's an interesting little detail. But Viserys, I mean, the trip to Driftmark, I continue to just feel worse and worse for this man. He can't hold himself together emotionally and physically. He's throwing up over the side of the boat. Lionel Strong there with a nice napkin. You can really just depend on that guy. But you see the way that he's disrespected. He shows up to Driftmark. There's no one there to receive him. But the Valerian children. Oh, Corliss, he's really tired. So not only do you have to make the trip to Driftmark, but I'm going to make you come a little further yeah. to show you who's truly in power here. And I felt the vibe around Corliss in this episode was, he's the actual king. <laughs> he was like, we've got the largest navy, we've got half the dragons. When they announce him at the introductory feast, oh, yeah, they the, came the, in. the, dr the drum yeah. scared the shit out of me. That came in, I was, what the hell was that? Even Rhaenyra was like, Where'd that come from? I didn't get drums. <laughs> and he walks in with his crew behind him, his family, the silver hair. Just like I said, they feel like the ones with actual authority. Oh, yeah. But, you know, Viserys arriving there, he's just also done with it, right? There's nobody to receive him. He's like, eh, let's just get it over with. Uh, yeah. I, the, the vibe around the Valarians are like... Like you said, they do have this nobility about them, this sternness, like everything that you would perceive as a, a royal family, especially when you compare Viserys to Corlys. But yeah, obviously they have the conversation about what it, okay, you want our children to marry, but what does that mean in terms of their heirs or what name do they take? And I think that's a lot of questions a lot of people had going into it, like, Sure, if Rhaenyra marries whoever she marries, whoever their kid is going to be, will that effectively end the Tar Targaryen di dynasty? Um, but I think they came to some sort of compromise where it would be a Valarian until they ascend the throne and then they would take the name Targaryen. There was a pridefulness in the way Viserys negotiated that, mm -hmm. saying, yeah, they'll have their father's name when they are born, but when they inherit the Iron Throne, they'll be Targaryen. Corliss seems satisfied with that. It's a good push and pull. Henry Clay, you know, it's a, the art of the compromise. I got such a kick out of some of the really situational comedy in this episode. Like when Rhaenyra and Viserys are in the wagon together and he gives her that look of, please don't do anything to fuck this up. <laughs> and it's just such a quick moment. It's like a five second scene. Yeah. It's just that one look of, I love you, but man, sometimes I can't stand you. <laughs> and I can't stand all of this. It's yeah. just all such a game. And I've got, to, you know, I got this stuffy nose. I'm cough. The cough is nasty, man. Well, even when Rainius came out and the way Corliss, obviously they were being, you know, what anyone would do if you notice a king being under the weather. Like, oh, can we get you anything? But they kept like repeating it, like almost to establish that you're like weak right now. Yeah. You, you need a chair? Yeah. You want me to get a chair? I can get a chair. She's holding his hands, the, you know, feeling the fingers like, are you okay? Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. fine. No, you're not. Clearly. So they didn't like come out with it, but they basically made it. No one's like, oh, we can see you. 
Right, and they're playing into that. Even though they look like Rhaenys and Viserys, she doesn't even greet him formally. It's cousin, they embrace. Uh, but yeah, they understand that he's in a weakened position and they're going to use that to their advantage, even though he is family and he could possibly be a very strong ally. But like I said, it's the Valerians that feel like the people who are in power. And I also, you know, I appreciated that quiet moment between Rhaenys and Corlys where she sort of checks his ambition, saying, you're going too far with this. We're in a good position as we are right now. We have, as he says, we have half the dragons. We've got this big army. Why push it even further? Yeah. But Corliss is a man of ambition. He's got that glance over at the harpy mask. He's feeling himself. He's coming off of a victory. Why not go for the throat here? Yeah, him, uh, when it comes to Laner being like, oh, it's just a phase. He'll grow, he'll grow out of it. Something. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually probably like a more progressive stance than I would expect from a medieval lord <laughs> to be like, oh, it's let him have his fun now. But we have seen like... Like Lady Olena. Yeah, in different situations, like the high lords like rarely care. They usually just want to make sure it doesn't affect them or it doesn't like get out and can cause some unwanted drama when it comes to this. But like even Rhaenyra and when Laner have that talk, like it was a very nice talk. It's like, hey, like, you know, what was it? Roast duck and goose? Yeah. By the way, duck. Whatever the duck is in this situation, I want that. I, I don't want to eat a goose. Duck is good. Duck is delicious. You ever have duck? No. Mm. But I've had goose. You've had goose? No, I yeah. haven't. Um, but yeah, I'm coming to that understanding, knowing that um, obviously, I guess, Laner's sexuality is you know a bit of an open secret in court. So her giving him the freedom to pursue his interests while she pursues hers. So that was a right. nice little understanding. Yeah, the unspoken communication or, you know, speaking in riddles, just basically becoming best friends by the end of it, thinking, man, this is the perfect arrangement. Your family's powerful. My family's powerful. We can do what we want, be with who we want. And I thought the scene that he had with uh, Sir Joffrey, that's what I made the point the other day that House of the Dragon to me looks better than Rings of Power. And it's because of moments like this, man. The lighting perfectly sets the mood for this romantic encounter between the two of them. And it's like they finally have everything that they've been hoping for, Mm -hmm. this opportunity to be together without being under the spotlight, without it causing a headache for his family or the Targaryens. It's really just the perfect scenario. And I think the lighting, the mood of that scene captures what they are feeling. And it was a very sweet embrace between the two of them. Yeah, it was a nice moment that I guess makes what happens later on in the episode a little bit more personal to the audience and like more. Oh, yeah. yeah. People were pointing out the... In both scenarios, he's lying over Joffrey. Yeah. So, but, but uh, man, the look of them walking on the beach at Driftmark. No, Driftmark Whew. looked great. I think so. That um, was stunning. Yeah. These settings, man, you really, this is the home of a great lord of Westeros. This right. is where they should reside. Yeah. And it's always cool when we get to see new settings, especially, I mean, we get, we got to uh, many, many different places in Game of Thrones, but yeah, there are some places we still haven't seen yet. So Driftmark was one that I think really captured the Valarian presence. But yeah, they have that conversation. And obviously one of uh, Rhaenyra's paramours is uh, Sir Kristen Cole. My God, dude is... I was thinking if this guy had a deeper voice, he'd be unstoppable. I think he could have convinced her with I think a bit the more baritone. Voice, the soft voice with the ferociousness as a fighter, I think that blends well. Not in this moment. I think if he hit her well, with the Rhaenyra, yeah, well, here, run away it comes with off me. with, I mean, Came come off on. a bit whiny. I mean, not only that, it was just embarrassing him to watch. It was embarrassing to watch him After one night, confess presumably. his love. After one night. But the looks that Rhaenyra <laughs> was giving him the whole time, she was never, ever buying into yeah. this. And she's got to have that. I won't even get into it, but... <laughs> You know what I mean? Okay, right. Yeah, because he is. He was gonna. He was in tears. My God, you're a king's knight of the king's guard. <laughs> <laughs> Pull yourself together, man. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, basically, like you know, you know, it's better than being. Remember that time we were talking about like how the small folk, like they have the freedom and they don't right. have to worry about all this. Let's do that. And she's like, no. She's like, wait a minute. I'd do that anyway. Yeah. I literally just did that last episode. That was part of our whole encounter. I can do whatever I want, but I'm still the crown. That was a bar. You know, it's not about me staying here for the crown. I am the crown. Mm. Aegon the Conqueror conquered these seven kingdoms. i got to continue that legacy. I don't want to live so in that Essos. Arya can kill the Night King. I don't want to do that. The Essos. I don't but it's, want to it's do that. With same you. thing with Daenerys, right? She yeah. conquered. She could have potentially conquered all of Essos. Probably would have been more difficult. But still, you had a good thing going. And it's the pull, you know. It's my family's legacy. This is what I was born to do. And it's the same thing with Rhaenyra. And I think with Kristen Cole, it's similar to Alicent in a way, where they become so hung up on duty 
and what that definition is. So if they go against this perceived idea of honor and responsibility, it breaks them. So he becomes this sort of emotionally uh, wrecked man, yeah. and he confesses his love. And it's like I said, it's it's embarrassing and cringy to watch because the whole time Rainier is just not not into it. You don't know if it's like necessarily embarrassing, like if that's what it, like. You know, he obviously feels a certain way, and is and his situ- You're confessing something to someone who doesn't even like you that way. That's super embarrassing. Well, she made the deal to keep him as a paramour. Yeah, paramour zones. I'm I'm good with that. Yeah, you are yeah. sure, but I know. But yeah, like- and if you would have reacted the way Kristen did to that information, that would be embarrassing. That's my point. <laughs> Well, I think he, he had the perfect scenario. Well, I think coming from him, like you said, just like in this, like certain characters, like when they bro, ma- you broke your vow, move on. But like for a lot of people, that's devastating because they're fucking stupid. <laughs> I'm just saying, like they're dumb and primitive. For him, he just did like the worst, like that he considers to warrant the death penalty, as he talks to Allison later. I do wish that scene between Allison and Kristen Cole was a little bit better in terms of just like. Not necessarily how it all played out and what it caused, but that being the like, first of all, him just being like, just like, hey, Kristen has it. I I fucked Rhaenyra. It's like, oh, I was just seeing if you would finish those status reports. Um, okay, I uh, did it. Sorry. <laughs> all right, let's let's take a couple se- steps back here. Start from the top. Um, yeah, he just comes out with it, and for Allison, like, sure, Rhaenyra lied to her, but I think for that to sway you, and obviously that conversation she had earlier with Otto, I feel like she's being not threatened but like the fear mongering of what's going on and I guess the way that like she has a new perspective on what the future may hold rather than what she thought probably oh my best friend's gonna be queen and we'll all live harmoniously and Aegon will be one of the princes and kind of just all be together as a royal family and now it's like no Rhaenyra will probably kill you you and your children (laughs) Because they threaten her claim. And along with that, you also had Laris uh, Strong whispering Instant in Allison. Instant favorite. Yeah. So good. Hunchback, Kane, speaking in riddles. Combination, literally, of Littlefinger and Varys. Laris. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just uh, sticking well, his foot in the shit that doesn't concern him. No. Well, there are theories now that maybe he's a green seer, which I wouldn't hate. That's sort of how he has this knowledge, because how the hell would he know? I know rumors spread fast in the Red Keep and throughout the capital, even to the Vale, because Ray Royce got wind of the Damon's comments about the sheep. The Vale sheep might be willing, even if I'm not. I think he's just so unassuming. You saw on the Hunt episode that he sat with the ladies instead of going out and hunt with the hunt with the men. So just picking up gossip and just putting himself in situations that I think most men, it's not normal for them to be in, where he can just kind of go around unassuming, pick up all this information, keep his ears open, and start putting shit together on his own. Yeah, and I love when Game of Thrones did this, talking in metaphors about things that represent the people who are being spoken to so he comments on the flower that was only able to grow in bravos no one thought it would grow in king's landing in this environment so allison's like wow i guess i'm the flower the whole vibe of that character such a great schemer you know he's he's got the fingers twirling you know (laughs) he's pulling his own little strings and i think that's just such a great introduction right i think like you said he is very unassuming so when you see him at the hunt you're thinking oh who's this guy i kind of feel bad for him yeah his vibe right away was just something of like this immediate schemer and just <laughs> yeah. stirring kind of shit skeeves up. you out a bit yeah Ooh, i don't want to be around this the guy. strongs are such an interesting family and lionel like again right away just always super protective of the king super down for the realm doing his job hand of the king obviously new hand of the king uh harwin strong just big 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 strong big, guy big man big beef guy football player <laughs> yeah just does his job and just looks good doing it and that's all the little crush on Rhaenyra and Laris just scheming yeah they're a great family I got a bunch of different characters there yeah so at this point like Allison is being fed all this information she's probably scared I feel like she's just looking for a reason yeah. right everyone keeps in telling her that war is inevitable that eventually Aegon and Rhaenyra the realm's going to be split so it's like okay I'm going to question Kristen I'm going to get this confirmation. That's enough. If it's going to be inevitable, I may as uh, fabricate my own reason to be pissed off at Rhaenyra. And it's sad because I think, you know, just skipping ahead when she does show up in the dress, Rhaenyra feels attacked. She looks suffocated. Like the air has been zapped out of the room. It's just so unexpected, right? It's a day to celebrate her and all of a sudden 
damn, did she just declare war on me? What the fuck? So I think in this episode, yeah, it shows that Allison's been manipulated to the point of just accepting what it is. You know, it is what it is in Allison's case case at this point. Do you know what the beacon of Old Town, what color it glows? (laughs) I didn't mind that as much because I feel like that's something two characters would say. Yeah. Because it's kind of like, oh, shit, are they really doing this? They gonna do this here? I mean, the perfect place. I think, yeah, Allison when she comes out, especially during that speech of Targaryen strength, <laughs> and to come out at that perfect time in that green dress, take the basically like you said, the air out of the room. That was such a boss move, and I love Allison Hightower. Well, there were two instances of Viserys' speeches being interrupted, and both were hilarious. I kept imagining laugh tracks in the back of my head, just based on this guy's reactions. When he has to gather himself after Damon arrives, he like looks around, t- swipes like, his cheek a little bit. I could have sworn I banished him. And the little nod to give him a chair, right? Yeah. No matter what, he's the DJ Jazzy Jeff of Westeros. You kick him out, and he's just there the next episode. <laughs> you know, so he struts on in, little nod between them. Like I said, there's so much great visual storytelling. The characters are saying so much by not saying anything. Well, but even, his reactions, man, to everything, the way yeah. he's just looking around, he's, he's just been fantastic all season. <laughs> well, even uh, Lord Royce, when he confronts Damon about, basically, you murdered my cousin, and Damon's like, pretty much, what are you going to do about it? Give me all our stuff. <laughs> Can you prove that in a court of law? Where's my inheritance? <laughs> These are the only two things I want from you. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and if I, you know, come to see Runestone, let's hang out. Yes, I have nothing against you. No, you're fine. You're great. Yeah. And yeah, I liked Rhea too, but she was just caused a bit of a problem. No, it's, it's very tragic. Yeah. Viserys, after giving his condolences and hearing that, they, Lionel too, thinking, damn, this guy just fucking causes problems. <laughs> yeah, he's literally just... Every time he comes back to King's Landing, he comes with He can't new just problems. hang out. No, can't just be a dude. Yeah, that was funny, man, his arrival. And Viserys loves... He's such a politician, right? I, I think one of the strongest comments on that, or maybe it was the Lannisters, oh, he's not going to like that she interrupted his speech. You know, when she sits down, uh, he he turns to Lionel, where was I? Where was I at the part of the scene? Oh, uniting the two houses. Oh, right, 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 yeah. But it is an important moment because it is House Valerian, House Targaryen coming together, showing that unity, the two houses yeah. of Vol Valyria. But Allison's not there, so it shows that there is a rift, that even, they aren't all united. Even the look she's given Viserys, she is disgusted by this man when he's eating. Like, she just wants no part of him. <laughs> yeah, great last supper shot. Uh, I love when directors do that, and Claire Kilner's been absolutely killing it. But I love the way that the royals were positioned. They're on the high table. Everyone's there to see them. They obviously have the most power. But you see all the maneuvering that's happening, all the pieces that are moving around, the characters communicating for the first time, like Damon and Lena, Lenor and Rhaenyra having their dance, or Joffrey and Sir Kristen. And he's just always in the background watching as all these pieces move, powerless to do anything about it. So when the chaos does ensue, nobody cares that he's there watching over them. They still, you know, the violence still breaks out. And even Rhaenys and Corlys, they're powerless as well, too. And I think that goes back to Rhaenys' point of, knives will come out. Do you want to put our family in this position? Yeah, we've got dragons, we've got a navy. But what did they do in that moment? Nothing. They were absolutely powerless. Well, you have, I mean, the music... The way it was shot, the glances characters are giving to each other, with uh, that all complemented with the dancing, like it, the buildup was just so palpable. Like it was like you could feel it, and you could smell it. You could smell it. I smell. Yeah, this room smell crazy. <laughs> yeah, um, with all those things combining, creating this atmosphere that I think was pretty incredible. Like obviously, like I said in the beginning, weddings aren't typically known to go over smoothly, but. This one, for like, it's like you knew something bad was going to happen. Then you have Joffrey have that conversation with Kristen, and Kristen just looks like a man defeated the whole time. Even, I think, Joffrey tells Laner, is like, that dude's cunt truck. <laughs> yeah, what a phrase. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, they were able to pick up on it real quick. <laughs> and it's like, we just say simp. I found her paramour. It's Mushroom. <laughs> which paramour, was confirmed to be Mushroom. Paramour is a dope-ass name. Yeah, I like how they use that. And concubine is fun too. That's what I would like. He's like, well, I'm going to be your whore. I'd be like, no, power more. No, and I think Kristen would have been like, oh. Oh, that sounds much better. Okay. That's a title, right? Power more cool. I like that. Yeah. yeah. You're my power whore. 
Oh, I don't like that. Uh, I don't like that pun. But his conversation with Kristen, I mean, he's not even willing to engage or acknowledge or like he's just beaten up at this point. And even going back to his conversation with Allison, just him being ready to accept the death penalty, I think it shows how much like his position and his honor means to him, even though he did break his vow. Like it's kind of like what Rob like had to, well, book Rob like had sex with the woman that was tending his wounds and his honor was so strong that he's like I have to marry this woman yeah but he's really cosplaying honor at this point it's his idea of honor and I think he was never really up to it so when he did break that oath it's oh it's natural to just ask for a death sentence but he just seems like you know they've set him up as the knight in shining armor and Game of Thrones always did this and they flipped it on his head no, he's he's unhinged. He's emotionally unbalanced. If this can set him off, then what else is this character going to do? And it's great foreshadowing, right? We mentioned it in uh, during the hunt when she complains about the Lannister brother, and he goes, "Do you want me to kill him?" Yeah, this man's gonna kill himself over the pussy. What is he gonna do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> That's our second sponsor. Look at that <laughs> Klondike? Klondike bars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great transition. They're yeah. gonna absolutely love that. <laughs> Um, but it's amazing the way that this character's fandom changed on him switched up in seconds because of what he did in this episode he was the beloved Kristen Cole he's so handsome I understand Rhaenyra I totally get it and now it's like what (laughs) (laughs) but yeah like that conversation with Joffrey I don't know if Joffrey maybe he was being a little like elbow to the side you know but I think Kristen was just like I'm not in the mood for this this is not what I want to hear right now. Yeah, it's kind of got a threatening vibe to it as well. Yeah. I know his secret. You know her secret. Let's make sure that those secrets are kept for everyone's sake. Well, I think it's something you have to establish. Sure. But he also couldn't have could have just said nothing. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know. Probably it's, still be alive. I think he felt a little too confident in his position. Yeah. I'm here with Lanor. He's my best buddy. King We're Consort. in love. Yeah. King Consort, right? I'm untouchable at this point. We finally made it. And... He gets touched. He's literally not untouchable. Times. Yeah, no, he gets tagged up. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, before we get to that, I mean, we could talk about Rhaenyra and Damon and that conversation they have. Once again, flirting in High Valyrian, her telling him, kill my father's Kingsguard, take me to Dragonstone, and let's get married. You know your husband's right over there. <laughs> You're soon to be husband. So those two, it's just great when they switch over to the Valyrian. It's like no one's listening, and no one is because no one can understand it except Viserys. But he's all the way over there, and the way they sneak that kiss uh, right in front of him, they just don't care. Nobody yeah. respects this man. It looks from he was Corlys to, yeah. to Damon to Rhaenyra to Alicent. He's just getting disrespected the entire episode. But like I said, that conversation further establishing that the romance between Rhaenyra and Damon, which is fun to watch for some people and disgusting for others, but it's there. Yeah, and then he goes. It's flirts still, with, it's still brewing. And he goes and flirts with Lena. Can you blame him? <laughs> Damn girl, I can't wait to not have sex with you. <laughs> right. My brother fucked up. I think she, uh, she, you know, we don't get many moments with Lena in this episode, but I think she established the the maturity of the years that sure. she is ready to kind of take on the role as an adult in this world. That she's able to go back and forth with a character as clever as Damon and and hold her own. Those are some of the best sparring moments of the show. Is when it's just two characters showing off their intelligence. And I think their time away from really being part of the Seven Kingdoms t- technically they still were, but you know, just the divide that. That whole situation in the stepstones cause. Um, I think that gave him a lot of confidence as a house. It's like we could do this on our own. Like they need us. The king literally just came to beg for our family to join houses. Right. And now that we have, even though we're bound by blood already, but now we literally have our blood on not on the throne, but right there. Like, yeah. They probably feel untouchable as well too. Do you think that when they set off for a place? They let the ship sail for a few hours, and then they fly in with the dragons to make it look like they're all keeping with the same speed. Because those dragons are so much faster. There's no way they're taking off at the same time. I think you they keep, just go you, for you a joyride. You keep, yeah. <laughs> but those dragons are too fast, man. A couple flaps. It's like me walking my poor little dog. One yeah. step for me is like ten for her. They're just showing off. But that was a great look at Maylis, Rainy's dragon. Mm-hmm. Once again, just dragons flying around. They're there. They exist. So Rainy's is a character that was supposed to be queen. She wasn't, but she still has this in her back fucking pocket. I also loved uh, Jason Lannister <laughs> talking to King Viserys and Rhaenyra, and the last dig that she gives him. It's always great to have your presence. Your presence is always such a pleasure, Lord Jason. Princess, your grace. 
Fucking asshole. Making jokes about women being late to the <laughs> battlefield. Women be late. Am I right, All guys? those women. Yeah. I think the smaller moments in this episode were really well done as well. Um, but yeah, I think the big moment at the wedding, it's... Uh, I wonder what it was that just set him off in that moment. Well, that's why it's it was shot so well, because we'll never know. Yeah. And the most important people in the story will never know. So it's just going to be based on testimony, right? He could say Joffrey threw the first punch, or he instigated it, but... Kristen sure as hell finished it, and everybody did see that. But I think the setup to that, the confusion, like I said, not only for the characters, but for the audience, you don't know what's going on. It's like this ruckus, and you hear this clashing. It almost sounds like a monster infiltrated oh. the wedding. Like there's some sort of beast in the middle of the crowd that's. It was like one of those tumbleweeds of Looney Tune cartoons, you know, when everyone gets fucking <laughs> mixed up in the brawl. And like I mentioned before, the royals at the high table, there's nothing that they can do. They can't even see what's going on. It's only Lionel Strong who gives the word to yeah. his son, which was such a great moment. Little head nod. Okay, I know what to do, Dad. I'm going to be big man. <laughs> He's got like 30 seconds of screen time and has that, taken the hearts of every <laughs> stan on Twitter. He was like the dude at the beginning of RRR who just runs into a crowd, beats the shit out of people. He's just a fucking fullback. Uh, it was funny. Somebody said that he fireman carried her out of that crowd, just threw her over his shoulder. Rhaenyra is literally living most people's dreams right now. Between Damon, Kristen, <laughs> and Harwin Strong. Yeah, she's living Twitter's dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three most thirsted after characters. He he got a whole fan base with him one night. Literally. He's going to get fan cams. He's going to profile pictures. He doesn't even have enough footage to make a fan cam. Yeah, you just need to really chop up that scene. <laughs> yeah. And him reacting to Rhaenyra slaughtering the boar. Because <laughs> he got <laughs> such a kick out of that. But that was great. Like I said, little head nod. But... Well, I think Kristen's losing favor. But he... um. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, like you said. Just what do you think was wrong with that? Fusion surrounding that, just setting him off. I think everything that, it, all the build up to that. I think he was just ready, just, I'm going out, so might as well go out by beating up this poor guy to death. Yeah, it was, it was sort of a death wish type mm -hmm. of thing. I'm just going to assault this knight, assault a nobleman, because he punches Lanor in the head. I'm going to commit all these crimes because uh, I've had it. I'm done. I've snapped, basically. He, he lost his mind. In this moment, it's and like the the confusion of the setup. It fits perfectly for Kristen because everyone's asking, "What made him snap? Why did he do that? What the hell happened?" I like that that we don't really know. It's not clear, and it's you know, it's not clear as to why he snapped because he's got a chemical imbalance. I don't fucking know. But no one had any power in that situation. And like I said, I keep going back to this point with the nobles on the high table. You can play your games, you can make your moves, you can have your marriage arrangements, all of that stuff to further your power. But when the shit really pops off. That's what it looks like. So what are you in a position to do when that happens? Nothing. So you have this poor man whose head has been bludgeoned over and over again. Absolutely brutal. He went to Kristen as a barber and said, give me the Oberon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And Laner having to witness that and then crying over his dead body was... You know, it was sad. It was well, a sad the, moment. The scream that he lets out. Yeah. But Joffrey just... It's the old saying, tugging on Superman's cape. You tug on that white cloak at the wrong time... It's going to hit back. And I think that's exactly what he did. He just made a very crucial mistake. It was the wrong guy to fuck with in that moment. I, I Maybe he thought that there was going to be a mutual understanding between the two. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll work together, buddy. Yeah, dap him up. Be like, hell yeah. yeah. Oh, cool, man. We're like the same. We just be fucking. Yeah, we just be fucking. It's like, nope. <laughs> um, yeah, and then him going to the godswood and basically committing... Honor suicide, right? Um, yeah, well, not right, yeah. being stopped by Allison, which is going to add a whole other wrinkle to this whole mess. But well, it was a perfect way to could, end this first yeah. half of the season before the time jump. That yeah, final definitely. shot shared between them. You could tell that, like, but like you said, it is kind of like a he has a death wish because he wasn't just going to murder this person and then be like, oh well, okay. Now what? It's like, I'm going to murder this person and then I'm going to kill myself. Right, yeah. Or hopefully somebody will kill me. Yeah. I'll be reprimanded and they'll chop off my head. Somebody just please end it, which is sad. But when you snap that way, it is hard to be sympathetic. But for Allison, she sees an opportunity. And the whole episode, the title of the episode being the words of, Heist, of House Hightower, We Light the Way, she sees an opportunity here to bring him over to her side. It's a very valuable ally. He's obviously a strong fighter and he knows a lot of secrets. And it also will cause some uneasiness at court as it pertains to Viserys and Rhaenyra to show that I have the power to retain him 
after what he did. And he's going to be a presence here. He's going to be someone that you guys now have to deal with. I wonder what the spin zone is going to be. She is the queen, right? So Kristen gets summoned in the beginning of the episode. I just left the princess. No, it's the queen. She's got that power too. Probably the second most powerful person in the kingdoms. Arguably the most, because at this point, Viserys, I don't know what type of power this man is wielding. (laughs) Yeah, no, she definitely has enough pull right now, especially now that she realizes it and she can... Like, I I don't think this character two episodes ago would have made the the decision to be late to the wedding and walk out the way she did. But I think she's feeling herself a little. She realizes she does have the power and fuck that, I'm not going to sit idly by and let everything else happen around me i'm gonna start making the moves that people have to react to yeah especially with all these men filling her head with these ideas of what rhaenyra will do once she comes into her throne because of aegon's existence because of her other children men in the realm the lords of the realm will support those children they'll believe that they have the rightful claim so war is sort of inevitable i don't know if that's necessarily true but it's definitely an idea that otto's put out there into her head and that could fuck with somebody, man. Yeah. This idea that, yeah, you, 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 the kids you love, that you basically your entire existence is dedicated to raising them. And as soon as your former best friend comes into her throne, they're going to be put to the sword. That's a horrifying thing to imagine. So she's being pushed. And I think this episode is when she falls over the ledge and she reemerges as Alicent, Lady Alicent of Hightower with the green dress, the, the color of their declaration of war. So in a very important episode for... Her. And that's one of the changes too. I think the Kristen killing Joffrey happens in a tourney in the book. So they made it like easier for him to kind of be like, oh, it was just a tourney. Well, the way this was set up, seven days of tourney yeah. and feasting, that happens. They speed up the wedding. Oh, we yeah. can't let anything else happen. Uh before these two get married the to fuck this up. still mourning over his, his boyfriend just being murdered in front of him. His blood is literally in the back. He still hasn't been mopped up. Somebody yeah. get a mop, right? Oh, somebody get a sponge. I don't understand. Why don't you get a sponge? And the mouse, the rat, is just enjoying the blood. Yep. I'm sure that he would like a little cheese to go along with that blood. Can't always get what you want. It's also, you know, really sad for Rhaenyra and Lenor having to get married under these circumstances after coming to an agreement, seeing eye to eye, going to keep each other's secrets, and then for Lenor to witness something so traumatic, so inhumane, complete lack of respect for life. And not only that, it's the person you love, and you don't, like you mentioned, you don't even get a fucking moment to mourn, to think about what just happened to process this terrible thing. It's uh, just another trial that they must go through in order to fulfill their duties. Show goes on. Yeah. Buck up, wipe those tears, and say your vows. You know what was a great scene, man? Uh, Lionel and Viserys talking about his legacy. Yeah, no, that was a very good scene. That was sad because we know the legacy, right? And they talk about it in the original Game of Thrones. <laughs> I think that's something... Not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, when he says, like, most men would have lied and said, I'm going to be Aegon reborn. <laughs> yeah, if you ever met, were met with a challenge, right? Yeah. I think there's something if to be... If you ever had to be a wartime king, sure, you'd be great. I think there's something to be said for peacetime king as well. Obviously, you're not going to have the songs of great victories if there's no wars to win. And especially Damon stole maybe his shot at that by taking out the crab feeder and all of that, but... It's never as sexy. No, The legacy not. of... Even Jaharis. Jaharis has that legacy of being probably the best king. Most peaceful, most prosperity, when Westeros made its most changes. But he's still not remembered as remembered as the Mad King. Well, there's a reason Aegon. why there's not a Jaharis series. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he kind of... You know, he tells him, oh, you're carrying on Jaharis's legacy. Which is true to an extent. But like I mentioned, it's it's just not as sexy. They don't really make songs about that. So Viserys is... It's sad, because he's in this state... Not only is he struggling to keep things together, but now he's questioning his whole legacy, how he will be remembered. You know, when you're bearing that Targaryen name, great things are expected of you, right? I guess he's feeling, I never got this opportunity to show how great I could potentially be. Which is weird, because you do have an opportunity, but it's a different type of opportunity. You know, it's a different type of ruling that he is mightily struggling at. Well, I think he sees the writing on the wall. Just his body is failing him. He's falling apart. His arm looks disgusting. And in the preview for next episode, he looks like a fucking corpse. So like... Yeah, somebody said he's hanging on by a string. So The fact that he's still around after the 10-year jump is... Woo, those must have been a rough 10 years. Well, he passes out at the end of the wedding, and having those two scenes kind of play off each other of Allison saving Kristen or stopping Kristen from committing suicide and presumably, like, 
getting him on her side and the king fall, uh, falling down and passing out, I think that was pretty well done. Just yeah. showing how the tides are kind of changing. And sadly, it is the final time we will see Millie Alcock and Emily Carey play Princess Rhaenyra and Queen Alicent. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that their ability to add real authenticity to their character's relationship played a major role in the success of the first half of this season. So many fans are disappointed to see them go, but uh, I think I speak for most of the fans when I say we appreciate what they've done and that, like I said, the show really wouldn't have been the same without them. I think when we, when we finally... It's going to be interesting how they just approach this jump or because it looked like in the previews it was just a regular preview but just with two new actors <laughs> so um i'm excited to see what they bring to the table and uh how how both of them approach these characters especially characters that have been established already so seeing that play out i think both of them are going to do a terrific job and furthering these arcs but yeah now we're really getting into some territory where like if you liked these first five episodes i mean you we're in for a treat here all right, guys, that does it for this video. Thank you for joining us for this review. For Aaron the Nerd Suit Monkey, I am Bo Oliver. Before we sign off, I want to quickly spotlight our weekly podcast, The Nerd Suit Podcast, published every Wednesday at noon. Every week, you could join myself, Aaron, Teddy, and the rest of the Nerd Soup crew as we discuss the hottest stories in movies and TV, equipped with some off the cuff commentary on the world of pop culture, while also providing extended reviews for the movies and shows we love. You can subscribe to our podcast channel on YouTube at The Nerd Soup Podcast, which can also be found on our Nerd Soup homepage, and you can listen to episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon music and all of the podcasting platforms we publish to thank you again for joining us on this review and we will be back next week to review episode six damn we were making some good points in that video Hey guys, Aaron and Nerd Suit Monkey here. Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. What can I say about you guys that I haven't already said about myself? You are the most important part of the channel and the main reason we keep going strong. Like Bo says, you keep the lights on in the fridge, so the fridge is full. Or, or something like that. So, from everyone here at Nerd Soup, I'd like to thank you guys for your continued support. If you're interested in joining the ranks of our Patreon supporters, head over to patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out the rewards we offer to our patrons. We recently dropped some new stickers for you guys to check out, or you could choose a tier that will allow you to select a movie, show, or video game for us to review. We've got a full slate of fan-suggested reviews coming your way, and we're really excited about the chance to review some of those movies and shows. We've also got t-shirts, mugs, behind-the-scenes videos showing how we bring our videos to life. And once again, thank you to all our Patreon pledgers who have been supporting us throughout the years. Without you, we wouldn't be able to convert all your pledges into cryptocurrency, so thank you from my future self for making us broke. broke.